You've never spoken publicly about no, something? No, not like this, no. For sure, like, it took me time to even try to call y'all back. It's something like, I don't know, like, I live with it every day. So, yeah, it is tough. Well, I met Sydney when we were younger. And we had mutual friends through the years. And then when we got out of high school is when we actually dated. September 2020 would have been four years of me and Sydney being together. We were going to think about getting married and having a future, you know, like having kids. Wednesday morning, when I woke up, my dad picked me up to go to work. And then Sydney got off that day, and about 1.32 o'clock, she went running. We were Snapchatting. And, like, she just Snapchatting me a picture of the gravel road, and that was it. No words, nothing. Time went on, I called her, texted her, called her, texted her, nothing was happening. So I just let time go on, because I get off at 5. Sydney's car was still in the driveway when I got home. I go in the house, and her wallet and keys were still in the same spot she left them. I mean, if she was going to go somewhere, she would at least have her wallet. And you don't know a woman that doesn't go somewhere without a purse. And that's when I knew something was up. It was the wildest thing I think I've ever experienced. Once everybody started hearing, there was probably 150 people that were on the look that day. I was outside of the command post coordinating searches. But someone came to me and said that we really needed to look at one of the volunteers. Quake Llewellyn, he had made a statement that he was the last one to see Sidney Sutherland before she disappeared. Initial information provided by Quake revealed that he saw Sydney at 2.45 p.m. on County Road 41. That's in our window when she probably went missing. Quake and Sydney, they both went to the same school at Tuckerman. They weren't friends. They just knew of each other. He said he passed by her, didn't stop. He spent maybe 20, 25 minutes at Tupelo Break. There's a water pump out there. I think he said he had to add some oil to it. He came back the same way that he went out there on County Road 41. And he said that uh, he didn't see Sydney on his way back. He didn't make any statements about seeing any other vehicles or or anything like that. It was very limited, very brief interaction that lasted about six minutes. I advised Special Agent McNeil that we really need to get Quake's phone. Michael, Quake's dad, he says, hey, you can search his phone. He's got Life360 app that his wife installed on, on his phone. Life360 is an app that it's basically used by families. You can add you and your wife and your, your kids onto the app. It shows where you went, where you've been, and how long you've been there, if you stopped, how long you've been stopped, the speed you were traveling when you went from point A to point B. It was either going to prove that he was totally innocent or that he was somehow involved. We go back to the day that Sydney disappeared. Quakes traveling north on Jackson County Road 41, just like he told us in his interview. And he crosses the, the highway US 67. He goes a few hundred feet, and he stops. And he travels back south to where Sydney, where her phone was located. The app indicates that he stops again. And it's stopped there for several minutes. I mean, what's the coincidence that she's going to go missing at a specific time when he goes past her and turns around and comes back? It appears that he's not telling us the whole truth. He turns around again. He's traveling at a fairly high rate of speed, which seems somewhat suspicious. We're thinking that he kidnapped her. Some, something happened because she was there, and now she's not. We see him travel approximately two miles, and 
he goes straight to a particular area that's near a wood line, and he stays there for about 30 minutes. At this point, I'm calling some other road troopers that are assisting with the search and rescue. I tell them, I'm like, you need to get your cadaver dogs into this location right here on the Life 360 app because I'm thinking if, if he did do something with Sydney, that she's going to be in that area. I was outside the command post. One of my investigators had called me on my cell phone and said they found a body. I immediately got in the truck and headed that way. It was on the north side of the interstate in the area we call Tupelo Break, right at the wood line at the edge of a field. We uncovered her body with our bare hands um, and lifted her out of the grave. I couldn't tell exactly how she died, but she had a lot of facial injuries. She was nude. Her shirt was pulled up over her face. When you've seen this person grow up and you've seen the type of person she grew up to be, um, and you, you know the family, it's hard. It's very hard. But you have a job to do, and you have to do it. I'm not just going to ask you one more time, quick. Just tell us, just tell us what you did. You're all in there, look. I see her, and I turn around just to get a better look. I don't see her in the same side of the room that she was on. But I do know that I hit her with the front driver's side much of at that point, I'm thinking she's dead, completely dead. So I take her, put her on my tailgate, and take her up to where I, where I lived. And I took her clothes off, and I went. I attempted to have sex with her. I gave up on it, and I cleared him, and now I'm married. The fact that after he hits her, it's probably 10 minutes, it's not even 10 minutes, he's raping her. I mean, that's not an accident. He act like he couldn't see her, but when you come off the overpass, it's pavement. It's not dust. He knew where she was at. I will never understand why he had to be so cruel, uh, so worthless to run over someone. So his story of being an accident is, it's BS. Tonight, Quake Llewellyn is a prisoner of the state and will never see freedom again. Llewellyn pled guilty to capital murder and rape, a life sentence without the possibility of parole. And we had to do our impact statements. I just told him he was an evil monster. We would never get to see her get married, to have kids. He took everything away from us that day. I mean, she was everything to me. I mean, really. I lost the best friend. I mean, I mean, I lost that a lot. Like, I lost a piece of my heart for sure. I don't have that certain somebody no more. 